Hey, everybody. I, I bet you thought we were lying when we said there'd be a part two to the poetry presentation. It's taken us a few weeks to get there, but we're here. And actually, look. And it's been created for a long time. It's just that we're just now getting to recording. It actually has been. And of course, I mean, I could go in and show you the date we created it, but why? You believe us, don't you? Uh, so welcome to another Professors Providing Professional Development. I'm Terry Lassay. And I'm Karen Perry. And today we're going to talk about the second half of the poetry uh, presentation that we wanted to give all of you. So uh, we're just going to keep on going and uh, talk a little bit about um, poetry uh, in a little bit more detail than we had before. Okay. We're hoping we haven't lost our internet connection. But it looks like we have, so we may just pause this for a moment. Okay, well, we think we have our technical difficulties solved for now. Um, it's always fun when we want to go online and the university doesn't want us to be online. So we're going to talk some more about poetry today. And there we go. Um, yeah, we can hit the arrow now. Um, well, in part one, we shared... Um, and we'll cover it a little bit again here, too. But we really covered in some of the um, things kids like in poetry, mm -hmm. um, ways to kind of evaluate poetry, especially for kids, and told you what they really kind of wanted. Right. And and I can tell you, and, and Karen will verify, that poetry is one of the most neglected or overlooked um, things that we teach in literature classes. And part of that is because of the way poetry was taught to mm -hmm. us. I have a good friend, Bob Sini, who says every time somebody says the word poetry, he smells formaldehyde because it was all about, it was all about um, cutting up the poem, finding all those little pieces, and what you were left with at the end was a big stinky mess. Dissection. Dissection. What does this line mean? That's right. Now let's move on. Why do you think the author used a semicolon? And, you know, by the time, even by the time I got to graduate school, I could care less. So <laughs> In elementary school, my one experience with poetry in a classroom was simply the teacher had us memorize a poem. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that poem to this day. I remember having to go through the process of memorizing it, but it absolutely did nothing for me. We not only had to memorize, we had to be able to write it out with uh, appropriate punctuation oh. along the way. Uh, I can remember very little of it. I think I've suppressed it because it's a bad memory. The way I talk about or approach poetry now is, first of all, you have to get, you have to just shove into the kids' heads that poetry doesn't have to rhyme. Right. Okay, so poetry doesn't have to rhyme. That's one thing. Also, poetry can be anything they want it to be. I tell them to let poetry it's one of the easiest thing for, things for them to deal with because there really aren't any rules with poetry. If you're the poet, you can make it be anything you want it to be. And so start with a poem and uh, keep a poem in your pocket. We have one day that we do that, a poem in your pocket day. That should be every day. And we should, as educators, have already memorized or have nearby short kind of funny poems that we can share. I love Mummy Slept Late and Daddy Fixed Breakfast by John Chiardi. It's from the collection You Read to Me and I'll Read to You. And uh, Chiardi is a winner of the NCTE Excellence in Poetry Award. And for kids who love Shel Silverstein and Jack Perlutsky, Chiardi was their precursor. So we should have short poems that we can share with kids anytime. This is from Callie Dacos's If You're Not Here, Please Raise Your Hand, Poems About School. My favorite one in here is called Teacher, Could You? Teacher, could you do what you ask us to do? Could you sit beside a friend and not speak to? I don't feel the need to then go on and dissect that poem. I think we pretty much know what it's all about. And if you'll realize, that was very, very short. Mm -hmm. That poem didn't take any time at all to read. If you did that throughout your day and had a couple of short poems, think about all the poems they will be exposed to. It doesn't take anything out of their day at, or out of your time at all to share some of these poems. So if you do a poem a day, that's 180 poems a year. And if we start in first grade and go all the way up to 12th grade, that's a whole mess of poems. I can't do the math in my head, but it's a lot of poems. And so there's really no excuse for you to say you don't have time to read aloud to your students because you can read aloud poetry. There's always time for And there's poem. always poems in any curriculum area you can oh, even gosh, go yeah. into. So if you teach math, 
I promise you, you can find poems. Greg Tang writes some math mm -hmm. poetry that I think is fun. But yeah, we can basically, we can find poems about anything and everything. Not that you have to connect it to curriculum. You can just share mm -hmm. it for enjoyment. I like this uh, blog here. It's poetryforchildren.blogspot. Uh, this is a posting from 2006, which featured kids' favorite poems. Um, I, I really suggest that you visit blog sites like this, like the one that Sylvia Vardell maintains as well, uh, for inspiration about different kinds of poetry. Because chances are, if you don't like poetry, you probably can't put your hands on some really good poetry very quickly. Uh, Karen and I are able to do that. We're sitting in the Lasane Review Center right now, and all we have to do is turn around and we've got books of poetry uh, just right, waiting for us to pick them up and share them with one another. We had no problem at all. It was so easy to turn and go to the 811s so on our shelf <laughs> so I could just pull one that I wanted, although mine was actually in everybody because I chose Chicken Soup with Rice by Maury Sendak. And I love those books, and, and we have the little copy of it because uh, they were made originally as those tiny books to fit tiny hands. And I, I just, I absolutely adore Chicken Soup with Rice. One of my favorite mm. kindergarten teachers never failed to share this um, book with her students all through the year because it teaches the months of the year. Yeah. And so she had it in big book form. And so her students were able to see the page along with her while she read it. And so here's February. In February, it will be my snowman's anniversary with cake for him and soup for me. Happy once, happy twice, happy chicken soup with rice. So if you don't know this, this book, you'll know that the, um, the ending is always something once, something twice, something chicken soup with rice. And the kids know that and they share it and say it with you at the end of every one of these poems. And choral reading is yeah. one of those things we want to do more and more of with kids. So criteria for poetry. This comes from uh, research done by two of my favorite poetry people in the world. Ann Terry, who has retired, but I was able to take a class from her, did the original research in 1974. And then my department chair when I was a classroom teacher in A-Leaf was Karen Cutiper. She replicated this same research in 1993. And found exactly the same thing that Terry had 20 years earlier. Kids prefer narrative poetry, poetry that tells a story. Um, Mommy Slept Late and Daddy Fixed Breakfast, uh, those kinds of things. But there are tons of narrative poems. They don't all have to be, listen, my children, and you shall hear the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Uh, that was probably one of the poems I had to memorize in middle school. Uh, but if they do tell a story, kids like that. What they dislike? Mm. Guess what? Haiku. And I suspect that's because most haiku is not written for children, but there are some hysterical, hysterical haiku specifically for children. Uh, they also don't like free verse, and part of that is because they really, really, really want poetry to rhyme. Yes, and they want a pattern. And they want a pattern. And free verse. A, B, A, A, B, A. You know, yeah. they want a pattern. That's right. Um, rhyme and rhythm and sound devices were very strong <laughs> preferences. That's what Karen go, basically sorry, just said. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. That's why limericks work yeah. really well. Kids like funny poems along with poems about familiar experiences and about animals. So uh, we will probably share a few of these books and we probably shared a few of them in Poetry Part yeah. One. Uh, but I'm reminded of Piggericks by um, Arnold LaBelle mm -hmm. right away and uh, funny poems oh my goodness there's just you know, no Michelle Silverstein. end yeah and Terry just shared the um, the the book here um, I forget what it was called if teacher oh teacher could you because mm -hmm. of course right there that's a familiar mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. school and it shouldn't surprise anybody that there was a preference for contemporary poems. Mm -hmm. um, I still am not awfully fond of The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. Um, <laughs> it just, it doesn't speak to me the way something, something like Every Time I Climb a Tree does, because I have more of a, of, of a experience for that. It's something that's contemporary. It's something that's almost universal in nature. Uh, additional criteria, there's a, blog, uh, a web link there for you to visit so you can see where some of this information came from. Of course, a little bit more, we already talked about rhythm and rhyme. Well, they want lively poems, so a nice meter, you know, something that they can definitely, definitely feel when they're reading. Um, definitely the play on words and sounds, visual images, um, and all that comes from the language that's chosen. 
Um, simple stories, the narrative part of it again. Um, they shouldn't be brought down to the child's supposed level. So there again, just like with literature, when we're talking about other books, you don't talk down to them like they're stupid. It's not just because they're young doesn't mean they can't get some of these things. Um, allow them to interact. So there again with that choral reading, like with Maurice Sendak's uh, Chicken and, Soup with Rice. And clapping along to rhythm or tapping to rhythm, or if you want to keep it quiet or just kind of bouncing heads to rhythm, that works too. The subject should touch a child, which goes back to it needs to be something that is relevant to their life and good enough for repeated readings. I'm telling you, those kids love Chicken Soup with Rice so much that they didn't care that they've gone over it before. They want to read it and hear it again and again and again. And same with Sarah, Cynthia, Sylvia Stout would not take the garbage out. We love it. Mm -hmm. You want to hear it again. And after you recite those poems 5, 10, 20, <laughs> 100 times to kids, uh, you'll find that you have memorized them. Uh, I know some of the Roald Dahl yep, uh, Revolting Rhymes by yeah. heart. I also know uh, several short poems by Paul Janesco and some other poets that I love because I've repeated them. And the kids will say, oh, oh, do that one again, do that one again. And, you know, it's really kind of a simple thing to do. One of my favorites with middle school kids was X.J. Kennedy's Lasagna. And I'd say, are you guys all ready? I'm, I'm going to recite a poem. And of course, they'd roll their eyes and make the groaning sounds that middle school kids are good at doing, you know, like, uh. And then I'd say, OK, it's called lasagna. Well, a few heads would pop up. OK, mm -hmm. it's about food. That can't be all bad. And I'd say, here's the poem. Wouldn't you love to have lasagna any old time the mood was on you? And the kids would like wait because they were sure there was more. And I'd say, no, that's it. Say it with me. Wouldn't you love to have lasagna any old time the mood was on you? By the fourth time, they had it memorized. I said, go home tonight, recite it for mom and dad, bring just a little signature that said you did that, and no homework Friday, you know, something like that. Uh, because I, the more that you recite it, the more that you hear it, the more firmly it stays kind of in your head. So I enjoy doing those kind of things with kids. And it also allows you, as the person that's reciting it, give the proper... Affect, um, feeling, emphasis. Well, you can perform it rather mm -hmm. than just recite it. And you don't, you don't have to be the best poet reader in the room. Uh, I've heard Ashley Bryan present poetry, and, and the fact that I even dare to recite poetry after listening to Ashley Bryan means I just, I just kind of said, well, you know, I'm not Ashley Bryan, <laughs> so I won't do that poem, but I will do a poem I know kids like. We included these additional criteria in here just to show you that it's not just the study from Ann Terry or Karen Cutiper, but time after time mm -hmm. after time, we know that kids like similar things in books. So there are places for you to go to start learning about some of the books that would be good to share with kids. And like with other Part, uh, literature that we've talked about, there are award lists that you can refer to to use as your um, foundation for what you're going to share. So we've got NCTE, Excellence for Poetry and Children, and the Lee Bennett Hopkins Poetry Award. And so the links are right there. And we're going to share some of the award winners with you mm -hmm. next. Yeah. So here's a so. list of the award winners going back to 1977. Now, some of these I'm not as familiar with because they weren't, uh, you know, like I said, I didn't have a lot of experience with, with poetry when I was younger. And so what I've had to do, I've had to kind of do on my own as I was going to school as to be a teacher and as I was a librarian and as I worked with kids. So um, some of them are a little bit further back than I have had a lot of experience with. But Terry, of course... I go loves, way back. I was already teaching middle school kids by the time the first award was given. And you'll see that initially it was given every year and then now every two to three years. So what does that tell us, Terry? Uh, well, what it tells is initially they wanted to make sure they cut a whole bunch of people before they died. Uh, I mean, that sounds terrible, but that's, you know. <laughs> yes, you, okay, you should it. You should get the award while you were still living. And although some of these people are still alive. Sorry, Arnold, I know you're still alive. Um, but uh, and what it tells us now is that uh, the criteria is fairly uh, onerous. I mean, this is not just, hey, you wrote a poem, good for you. These are people who have done lifetimes of writing poetry. I know that Karen knows Marilyn Singer and her work because we talk about those reverso mm -hmm. poems all the time. I love people like J. Pat Lewis and X.J. Kennedy because they're funny, and I love funny poems. And probably the woman who knew and and knew the most about poetry, um, and probably Lee Bennett Hopkins would agree, uh, is Myra Cone Livingston. 
And, you know, knowing the, the leading figures in the field, I think is really important. So if you're unfamiliar with some of these, mm -hmm. Now, go to, your these, library. go to your public library, check out the books. Um, I know Karen loves the Valerie Worth mm -hmm. poems, and we're going to talk some more about them in just a few minutes. A Jar of Tiny Stars um, was edited by uh, Bernice Cullinan, who's written one of the children's literature textbooks in the field as well. And what this is, is a collection of poems by those award-winning poets that we saw here. So it's a collection. You can check this book out and have a cross-section of poems by those poets who have been honored by NCTE. This book has been revised several times. It will have to be revised again because I don't believe that Marilyn Singer's work is in the latest edition. Not quite sure about that, but I'm thinking that that's the case. So if you're looking just for one good poetry anthology to have, this might be a place for you to start. Okay, it looks like the current book that is out right now um, that still is offered in new form is from 2010. Mm -hmm. And it is on Amazon for $18.76 with free shipping if you're a Prime member. Um, the older ones, the older versions are there um, mm -hmm. as well. You can get cheaper versions uh, yeah. as low as a penny with like three ninety nine dollars shipping. I get a lot of those, so I get a $4 book for a book that's, you that's know, right. we need in the area. So that's right. anyway, but you can get a brand new copy of the most recent 2010 edition on and Amazon. That, that would include everybody but the last three winners. There you go. So I'm thinking that probably in about a mm -hmm. year or so, NCTE will issue a new uh, revision of A Jar of Tiny Stars. So here we have Marilyn Singer. Um, this is, a, I know that we have these on our children's lit list, one of the books at least for people to become familiar with her style because it is uh, unique. It's um, Mirror, Mirror, so those are reverso poems uh, where you can uh, read the poem when you go down and then the words are reversed and it tells another poem when you read the words backwards. And so it kind of all blends in together into one poem. However, it just uses the same words reversed. It's, it's really amazing. I can't even imagine what it takes to create poems like that. Yeah. Uh, some of them are, you move the book upside down. I mean, follow, follow. So it's just her, her work is unique. And a lot of them are all, um, don't, don't they, aren't they fairy tales as A lot well? of them deal with yeah. fairy tales, mm -hmm. yes. So you've got motifs, you've mm -hmm. got archetypes and poetry all in one place and accessible by pretty young readers, which is also amazing. Uh, Joyce Sidman has won a couple of awards for her work in addition to the NCTE uh, Excellence in Poetry Award. This is Dark Emperor and um, winter bees and you can see that uh, these two at least uh, focus on animals um, in different habitats at different times of the day doing different kinds of things that animals will do this is not um, anthropomorphism we're not making these animals into people uh, but rather showing what happens to animals uh, in the wild animals as they live so they're again perfect for your science teachers mm -hmm. absolutely I love J. Pat Lewis, J. Patrick Lewis, um, and he's got a wide, wide range of poetry. So I've, I've given you two here that I think are phenomenal. Uh, Please Bury Me in the Library is a collection of poetry about books, about readers, and about libraries. So who wouldn't love something like that? He also then edited for National Geographic the Book of Animal Poetry. So uh, you can look and see that they're, they're beautifully illustrated with photographs, and they're not just dog and cat and bird, but as you can see from the cover, cover, excuse me, giraffe. What an adorable picture that, that is. Isn't that just too, too cool for school? And this was, it won all kinds of awards a couple of years ago when it was first published. Oh, yep. Okay, Lee Bennett Hopkins. Lee Bennett Hopkins. If you, bugs. Yeah, if you know one name, mm -hmm. um, I think you need to know the name Lee Bennett Hopkins. Which you should know that because there is an award named after that he has funded, right? <laughs> uh, because as Lee will, Lee will tell you, um, poetry often gets overlooked, mm -hmm. and yet he's got wonderful collections, and his collections are sometimes all poems by him, but more often than not, they're collections of poets um, that some who some of whom may be familiar, some of whom may not be so so familiar. So when you look at, I love nasty bugs. I love nasty bugs. 
you know, Ode to the Mosquito. A dead mosquito. A dead mosquito. I hate mosquitoes. That's a great one. And Termite <laughs> Tune. Um, and then he's got a collection of poems about books. Um, he's got celebrations, poets about poetry about different holidays. You name it, you're going to find a collection uh, by Lee Bennett Hopkins that should not, you should not have to look terribly far mm -hmm. to find any of those. Nikki Grimes are always very touching. The serious subjects a lot of times, um, definitely for the diversity. Um, if you need, if, if you're looking for the We Need Diverse Books campaign, Nikki Grimes is definitely a poet to look for. Um, so here's an example of one of hers from Words with Wings. This, the picture is Daddy Poems. Carrie, do you have anything to add to that? Is no. that a po book book about dads, right? It's a, just, it's, just, it's it a, a collection? Of... It's a collection of her poems okay, about her. dads. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, wonderful father-daughter, father-son kinds of relationships that we see in the pictures. Uh, Marianne Hoberman, uh, the one book that I used over and over again is A House is a House for Me. And it's how different animals, different creatures look at housing. Uh, you know, a house is a house for me, but um, to a crab, a shell would be a house. To a butterfly, a cocoon might be a temporary home. So these are poems about habitats houses, again. houses, habitats. And she also has uh, her own version of, I know an old lady who swallowed a fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she'll die. Uh, that's narrative poetry. It's funny poetry. It's cumulative poetry. So kids can eventually chime in. They'll get to the, I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she'll mm -hmm. die. And it will just allows become, choral reading. that's right. Allows for that choral reading. I'm not familiar with XJ Kennedy. I am because he writes funny poetry. He actually has a collection of poetry called Slugs. And that's the first book I think I read by him. And I thought any poet who can write slug poetry is just wonderful. So you have here Bratz. And you just know from looking at it what it's going to be about. And Exploding Gravy. Uh, these are books that we won't have to book talk. These are books we'll put out and allow kids to just snatch up and scurry off and read on their own. And if you'll remember, he's the one that wrote, Wouldn't You Love to Have Lasagna? Any old time the mood was on you. That's from a collection by Paul Janesco, by the way, called Pocket Poems, which was a very small format um, collection of poetry by a variety of different poets. I was fortunate enough to meet Eloise Greenfield uh, shortly after the publication of Nathaniel Talking. We had both Eloise Greenfield and Jan Spivey Gilchrist here on campus for our Children's Book Festival. So uh, Nathaniel Talking is the story of this young man. His name is Nathaniel. He is doing the talking and he will tell you about his life. It's not always easy. It's not always fun, but he has wonderful people in his life and his mother certainly being one of them. Honey, I Love and other poems also illustrated by Jan Spivey Gilchrist. If you ever have a chance, listen to Ashley Bryan. Read Honey, I Love. And you will understand that while the, the words may look simple, the poem is deceptively deep and nuanced. Barbara Espenson is one of the more recent winners of the Excellence in Poetry for Children Award. And she writes a lot about nature. And so you'll get the cold stars and fireflies there. She has a wonderful collection of pond creatures. Uh, she's got um, Dance With Me. So it's about rhythm and movement. So you can see the range that she has as a poet. Valerie Worth, what I love about Valerie Worth is the simplicity and, and length of her poems. They are all super short. They're all the small poems and 14 more. All the small poems. I think there's one that's just called Small Poems. Small poems. Um, here's one of hers called Safety Pen. Closed, it sleeps on its side, quietly, the silver image of some small fish. Opened, it snaps its tail out like a thin shrimp and looks at the sharp point with a surprised eye. They're also about common objects. So there's another one that she wrote called The Fence. And they're just, so they're just common objects. So this is a great author to use with your students if you're having them write poems because you can give them a, have them choose from a bag 
of common objects that you find in your desk. Paper clips, erasers, pencils, pens, markers, an eraser, whatever. Just common everyday objects. I love, and who doesn't love small poems? Because again, uh, you don't have much time invested right. in it. You can read through them quickly. This is a great one for poem a day. You know, mix these in with some of the others we've looked at. Arnold Adolph, um, oh gosh, just wonderful poetry. Roots and Blues, uh, I think my favorite one is Eats Poems because they're poems about food. And he has a poem called Chocolate. And I'm going to try to remember it now. Chocolate, oh chocolate, I love you so. I want to marry you and live in the flavor of your brown. Mm. I just love it. It's actually a love uh, poem to his wife, um, the late um, Virginia Hamilton. Aww. I know. And when he told us that at the conference, I just kind of went, oh, I love you even more. Um, Adolf writes, again, not lengthy poems, but poems about things he knows, poems about things kids know as well. Uh, this is Lillian Moore, and she's got quite a few collections. I'd probably say about 10 or so the last time I looked. And this is Until I Saw the Sea. Until I saw the sea, I did not know that wind could wrinkle water so. I never knew that sun could splinter a whole sea of blue nor did I know before a sea breathes in and out upon a shore. There's so much there, so much there. Uh, but sometimes I just think it's good to read the poem, let the kids kind of form those mental images, and then maybe move on. And, you know, think about the visual image that it's creating. We saw, heard earlier that that's something that is um, needed for kids or they, that they like. They like it to create a visual image. But here's the thing, like where we are, well, where I'm from, Oklahoma, middle of the, we're totally landlocked type stuff. A lot of kids don't have experience with this kind of sea, with a sea. You know, they're at a lake, maybe they see some of this stuff, but they don't see this. So it might be something that you might need to show them a video to show them what water does when it's coming off of the ocean and the sea or the tide and the waves and all of this, because that would help them enjoy mm -hmm. this poem more because they would be able to then have that visual. Here's John Chiardi's You Read to Me and I'll Read to You. This is uh, the book that has Mommy Slept Late and Daddy Fixed Breakfast in it. And what I love about this book is some of the poems are for the child to read to the adult and other poems are for the adult to read the child to the child. I love that idea of you read some of them, I'll read some of them, we'll kind of meet in the middle. Uh, and they use uh, two different uh, text colors to tell you which ones you read and which ones the child gets to read to you. This is Eve Miriam, and I love You Be Good, I'll Be Night, uh, Blackberry Ink. She just has wonderful, wonderful, wonderful collections. She's one probably of, of the earliest uh, poets writing for children, and her poems kind of stick. They don't go away. They're popular year after year, reader after reader, generation after generation. And here's the grand lady of them all, Myra Cohn Livingston. Uh, these are birthday poems, so all poems about birthdays, calendar poems, which take you through the year. So you've got these wonderful collections, usually themed by Myra Cohn Livingston. Carla Kuskin, another early uh, poet in, in children's literature. And the reason we're showing you these going back in time is because kids tend to think there's Silverstein, there's Prolutsky, and then whatever the new hot poet happens to be. They need to go back and see that there were lots and lots and lots of books uh, of poetry that were written before. Uh, I love this. I'm up here. I'm up here. You're down there. And nothing in that space between us but a mile of air. Just a simple little poem about a kite. And Moon, Have You Met My Mother? Again, lots of wonderful collections of poetry here by Carla Cuskin. Same thing is true with Aileen Fisher. And if you notice that I'm talking a whole lot here, <laughs> it's because Terry's read these old books because she is old. Uh, but you want to talk about familiar kinds of experiences? Going barefoot. And then here's a little poem uh, are very much like the All the Small Poems by Valerie Wirth. And David McCord, um, 
in my SIG file way, way, way back in the beginning, I used the phrase, books fall open, you fall in. Mary Englebright, that's where you, that's where she got it. Delighted where you've never been. Uh, and so that was always part of my signature file. But also every time I climb a tree, every time I climb a tree, every time I climb a tree, I, um, oh gosh, I knew I'd forget something. I da 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 or skin a knee. I, I should remember these by heart. I've read them so long. And you can see there's the cover. Uh, you can see the ants marching across him. And it's just a kid talking about what happens when he climbs a tree and what he thinks about. Now, not I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree, but rather every time I climb a tree. Um, so some other folks that we think you ought to know, maybe a little bit more contemporary. I used this every year when I was working with uh, writing with students in the poetry uh, unit where, where I was doing poetry with them. Mary O'Neill Hailstones and Halibut Bones because this is nothing but a book about color poems. And they are, um, they're, they're beautiful and it, they create visual. Uh, you can definitely, um, you know, get the feel for these colors because it talks about emotions and not just concrete things that are those colors, but feelings and uh just just uh, everything there's there's gray and white and brown you know and so there's there's like i said it's a book full of color poems and if we eventually want to get kids to symbolism like the mask of the red death uh, by edgar Allan poe this is a book that starts them thinking about so why white why gray? Mm -hmm. And I love that the poem about gray. Why red? Why orange? Why yellow? Why green? Uh, so that kids begin to see that there are reasons why we use certain colors. Right. Because uh, when in we the talk one, about mood and tone. Because in the one for purple, it mentions royalty mm -hmm. and everything. So those things are in there. Um, what I did with the poems is I did sens sensory poems mm -hmm. with the kids to where they would they could talk about some concrete things, but they had to do, do feelings. They had to do uh, what they could taste. So they had to focus mm -hmm. on the five senses dealing with a color. So they would choose a color and then do those five senses with that poem. So they weren't only doing concrete things. I loved purple because it, it describes purple as being the great grandmother yep. to pink. And I always have that phrase in my head. And then it goes to when I am old, I shall wear purple. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I love this. One of my all time favorite mm -hmm poetry books, but it has to be performed with a partner. This is Joyful Noise, Poems for Two Voices, and you'll see it's got a gold sticker on it. This was a Newbery winner. Um, it's my, one of only mm, two poetry books to win Newberries. What was, the, I don't know the other one. The other one was A, vi a Visit to William Blake's Inn. Okay. Terrible that I know these little okay. trivia no, things. No, good. It's good. <laughs> um, uh, my favorite is Honeybee, just so you know. It's absolutely absolutely great to read because boy you can get attitude and and tone with that poem because the queen is one of the voices and one of her drones is the other and how opposite their lives are i like book lice uh, because they talk about living within the pages of a book this is something that requires practice. Absolutely. You can't just have the kids go up there and do a cold read. You need to have them know how to read the poem for two voices because at some point they are reading at the exact same time even though the words are different. Mm -hmm. So it does take practice. My students uh, back in the day when they could pick uh, a handful of Newberry, their choice, would always just jump on Joyful Noise because it's one of the shortest Newberries ever. And then they'd pick it up and they'd open it and they go, what do you do with this book? And it's like, yeah, don't pick a book by the number of pages. When I taught fifth grade, I had my students write poems with two voices after we shared some of these. And they did it from the loyalists and the patriots', patriots points of view. Because, of course, they had things, because you could think of it like a Venn diagram. They had things that were different that they could say on their own. But there were definitely things that they thought the same that where they could speak at the same time when they were reading these poems. And they were, it was probably one of my very favorite activities that I did during the social studies with my fifth graders. I absolutely love this collection. And then later you'll see people like Paul Janesco do dirty laundry piles, poems for four yep. voices. Uh, so you'll see that there was a trend there mm -hmm. for a while on having multiple voice narrators in poetry. Douglas Florian is another, he, he has many, many books. Uh, you know, Shiver Me Timber, so it's pirates, uh, dinosaurus, uh, so that's dinosaurs. 
Uh, so there's just a, a big collection. He also has his Insectopedia mm -hmm. and Beastopia. So there's a lot of collections that he has published. He's wildly popular mm -hmm. in elementary classrooms, and several of his books have been on our Blue Bonnet uh, nomination list. Oh, how could you not love Rule Dahl? Not the person, but the poet. And I love revolting rhymes. I always will love revolting rhymes. This is Little Red Riding Hood and the, and the Wolf. And um, I have memorized this poem because I used to perform it over and over and over again for students. And after you do that, no, I don't know, four, five, six times, uh, you find that you have memorized it. What Dahl has done is do the variants of the fairy tales and kind of poke fun at them. So in Little Red Riding Hood, when she gets to grandma's house and finds the wolf, she soon discovers, you know, he has big ears and big eyes and a fur coat. And the wolf gets really upset and says, you forgot to tell me what big teeth I've got. And uh, threatens to eat her and she whips a pistol out of her knickers and shoots him dead. So that when you run across him or her next in the woods, she uh, doesn't have the red cloak anymore. She has a wolf skin coat. And then she makes a reappearance in Three Little Pigs where she now has two wolfskin coats, but the poem ends, Piggy, you must never trust young ladies from the upper crust. Uh, because in addition to two wolfskin coats, she has a pigskin traveling case. So very dark, very funny. Kids absolutely love them. They're easy to perform. They don't take much at all. And they're just a whole lot of fun. James Stevenson is another one that has humorous poems. Um, I would say, you know, definitely... Um, if you like Jack Prolutsky type thing, mm -hmm. this would be one that you could also share. Uh, a lot of his deal with food, um, but not all. So this is just a, a collection. He kind of had one with corn chowder and corn and corn fed. You'll see. So kind of he was going along a little theme there for a while. I kind of like that. Um, of and course. of course, where would we be without these two books? Uh, I remember Jim Trelease once asking an audience, he said, how many of you have where the sidewalk ends in your classroom libraries? And of course we were all, I mean, yeah, we got it, Jim. We know about that. He said, how many of you have a classroom set? And everybody's hand went down. He said, because you know, that's the most frequently stolen book in the, in the school library. And we all went, oh, so we should probably have more than one copy. Um, who doesn't know Sarah Cynthia Sylvia Stout or I Cannot Go to School Today, said Little Piggy Emma McKay. Uh, there are so many of these poems that we have memorized and that kids have memorized over the years. Shell was not really setting out to, to write a whole bunch of children's books. He was, uh, he was writing for Playboy. He, for Playboy. Uh, he also wrote uh, A Boy Named Sue for Johnny Cash. Uh, little bits of trivia you learn along the way. But these two collections of poetry, oh my goodness, so popular with kids. Uh, Judith, uh, Judith Bjorst has If I Were in Charge of the World. She also has another collection called Sad Underwear that is also popular and includes great uh, poems. So if you know her, she's also the one that wrote uh, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day and, you know, other other books. But the Alexander books are ones you definitely would know. So uh, Mother Doesn't Want a Dog. Mother Doesn't Want a Dog. Mother Says They Smell. And never sit when you say sit or even when you yell. And when you come home late at night and there is ice and snow, you have to go back out because the dumb dog has to go. Mother doesn't want a dog. Mother says they shed. And always let the strangers in and bark at friends instead. And do disgraceful things on rugs and track mud on the floor. And flop upon your bed at night and snore their doggy snore. Mother doesn't want a dog. She's making a mistake. Because more than a dog, I think she will not want this snake. I just, I love the twists and turns. She has a version of Cinderella in here uh, where Cinderella's saying, you know, he kind of looked cuter last night. So I think I'll just pretend that this glass slipper feels too tight. Uh, and I love those kind of quick little turns at the end. She does it absolutely brilliantly. And there's Piggerix by Arnold LaBelle. It's a collection of limericks about pigs. There was an old pig with a pen who wrote stories in verse now and then. To enhance these creations, he drew illustrations with brushes, some paint, and his pen. And then the last poem is, he's finished his work, and there he's quietly sat with his comfortable cat while he rested his brushes and pen. And if you ever met Arnold Abel, and I was fortunate enough to do so uh, early on uh, in my teaching career, 
basically that's a self-portrait. He was a big guy. He wore a real bushy uh, mustache. And so he drew himself into his illustrations. Absolutely love Piggerix. And of course, Jack Prelutsky. That's another one that's almost like Shel Silverstein. If you're going to ha have a collection in your library besides Shel Silverstein, you're going to have a Jack Prelutsky on your school shelf as well. But they're funny poems. Absolutely wonderful. And I... Uh, Again, I've been in the business so long. He was one of the first poets who visited our school. And um, boy, you put him in front of a group of kids and he is just an incredible entertainer. When he does homework, oh, homework, I hate you, you stink. The kids are all reciting it along with him because they love that so much. Okay, that's another thing about his poems is don't they most of the time go to a song? Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. Yeah. Now, you don't always know which one because, you know, it's hard sometimes when you're reading to get the rhythm right away. Right. But his, if you'll, if you'll look at them, they, they have kind of a song behind them. Mm -hmm. Kenneth uh, Coke, and I assume that that's how you pronounce the last name, but I could really be wrong. Uh, these books go back again to when I was, you know, just starting work with kids. And I used Rose, Where Did You Get That Red? Uh, to help guide my teaching of poetry for children, because there was very little at the time uh, to help uh, teachers who wanted to use contemporary poetry, how to use it. And then Wishes, Lies, and Dream was, was the follow-up that you could use to teach kids to write poetry. So it wasn't just, I'm going to recite it. It's like, now how do we get kids to do some writing on their own? Paul Janesco. We love him. We do love him. Hi, Paul. Um, and, and this shows you kind of his range, although there's so many more here. Uh, a Kick in the Head is um, a wonderful collection illustrated by Chris Roshka. And it's about those weird phrases we have. So what is a kick in the head and why? how did we get to have that? And it's done in poetry form. The Death of a Hat is a compilation of poems that show the history of poetry going back to uh, BCE, before the Common Era, and coming forward. Some of them classic, some of them more contemporary. And then with Naomi Shiab Nye, several uh, years ago, several decades ago now, he wrote a collection called I Feel a Little Jumpy Around You, a collection of her and his poems in pairs. And uh, so you would have on one page an Emily Dickinson poem, and then on the facing page, a poem by uh, a male poet about something that was similar. And I loved that collection in pairs. It's just, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And almost all of these poems are either classic or classic slash contemporary. Now, Paul Janesco, all, oh, we have more of him. Good. Yeah. He also loves concrete poems. Yeah, he does. So you can definitely use him as an example for those. And because he is a poet, he writes wonderful books for teachers, uh, like How to Write Poetry, Poetry for A to Z, How to Write Haiku, and other short poems. So uh, go and, and take a look to see what Amazon has available uh, from him in terms of, again, using poetry with kids. Not only does he have wonderful collections, but then he also has just an incredible assortment of how to teach, how to use, how to get kids to do the same. Uh, I don't know if he's still doing it, but I suspect he is. He's often a poet in residence in schools and working with kids. He's, it's just amazing to see you what can he can get from kids. You can get How to Write kids. Haiku and other short poems for a penny. There you go. Um, some other resources. Sil Sylvia Vardell, uh, our fellow Texan at Texas Women's University, is a big person for poetry. And her and Janet Wong, have published several books together mm -hmm. on how to use, well, not just how to, she's given you the poems to use in the classroom. I believe there's like a poem for every day mm -hmm. of the of, of school. And um, there was one that was, I think, a general one, but then she's even done one for specific subject areas yeah. as well. So not only is there the book of poems, but then she also has like a companion book to go with them that is the, like a teacher's guide mm -hmm. that tells you then how to use those poems with your students. It, so there's a lot of resources out there from these two ladies. Absolutely a go-to reference for anybody who wants to do more with poetry and kids. So there's part two. Mm -hmm. We could probably do a part three because we can just talk about poetry ad infinitum, I think. We both love it. And I think because we learned to love it 
our kids learn to love it as well. And I think that's really important. I think the biggest thing is we, our kids at least are not intimidated by it. That's right. So that's, that's, that's a good step. Wait until they get to the wasteland in college. Then they can be intimidated again <laughs> by poetry. But in the meantime, offer them poetry for children, for teens. Not poetry about children or about teens, but specifically poetry that will reach out, tell them a story, make them laugh, talk about an experience that they know. Remember those criteria. And if you do that, you're going to have kids who don't moan every time you say the word poetry. Thanks a lot, guys. I hope you find this useful. As always, email us if you have a suggestion for a topic. Absolutely.